U.S. State Department has released its annual country reports on human rights practices this week, and U.S. Secretary of State Mike Pompeo spoke at a press conference alleging China, Cuba, Iran, and Venezuela were among the worst violators of human rights. In response to U.S. criticism, China has just issued a record of human rights violations in the U.S. So what's behind those two reports? What are the human rights situations in both countries? And how is the issue being politicized? In the first part of our discussion, I'm pleased to be joined from Beijing by Professor Huo Zhengxin of the China University of Political Science and Law, by Isabel Hilton, CEO of China Dialogue from London, Professor Juve Toker from the American Graduate School in Paris, and Gamba Nadere, a columnist with uh, Kayan International from Tehran. That's our topic. This is a dialogue. I'm Yang Ray. First of all, Professor Huo Zhengxin, what do you make of this report? I mean, actually, the release of two reports is, in fact, viewed as a media campaign against okay. each other on the issue of human rights. What do you think of the timing of releasing this report, particularly with the target on China? Well, uh, as the Chinese saying goes, that uh, it is only polite to uh, reciprocate. So I think it's natural and the logic that China released its report on human rights violation in the United States immediately after the U.S. government released such reports on other countries, including China. Um, frankly speaking, I do not find anything really new in the American report. Well, in my opinion, the uh, report uh, released by the U.S. Department of uh, State uh, reflects the judgment of human rights situations in other countries, measured by the American standard, American ideology, and American value. As a law professor, uh, frankly speaking, I do believe that uh, the international dialogues on human rights issues are very important. After all, no country is perfect in human rights issues, as the Chinese report today also you know, suggests that the U.S. has a lot of uh, human rights problems based upon the, uh, you know, many facts. But if you look at the uh, American report, I think that you will find that the American address this issue uh, with a sense of superiority, uh, which, which means that if you look at these, uh, the American annual report, the American describe itself as the uh, model and the leader in the human rights protection the whole world. So it's just like, it shout at China, Cuba, uh, you are bad guys, you have listened to me, otherwise I'll beat you. So I don't think it's a proper way in the international uh, community. As I say just now, equality and mutual respect are the preconditions of international <coughs> dialogues. <coughs> Another thing I want to mention is that though the protection of human rights is an internationally recognized principle, however, there is no uniform standard. So I believe that imposing the American standard on other countries is not justified. First of all, uh, we need to take a closer look at the definition of human rights. Um, let me go to Isabel and Jouf and uh, uh, Gamba. Do we have a universal understanding or universal standards in judging the uh, substance of human rights. I'd like to have a clear definition. Unless and until we can agree upon a common definition, we run the risk of talking past each other instead of talking to each other. So, Isabel, first of all, do you think we have a universally agreed upon definition about human rights? Well, for decades we have had exactly that, the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, uh, which is the United Nations uh, uh, instrument, uh, which, you know, is, is a universal declaration. Now, it has been, different parts of it have been differently emphasized by different countries, but the standard text is still uh, as close as we have ever come to agreeing a universal uh, uh, a definition and I think it's quite important to m make sure that that in all the uh, rather contentious uh, point of, of international relations that we've reached it's very important that we don't lose sight of that there was a moment when we agreed uh, nobody has actually dissented from it since although people have talked around it and passed it and 
over it and under it, but it's still very important to recognize that it's there. I've been to Europe many times, uh, Jouf Toka. The very thing that has impressed me most about uh, a principle that Europeans agreed upon, be they from UK, France, Germany, or other countries uh, in Central and Eastern European uh, areas, they all agree that human rights is very important. Why do you think in the wake of the Second World War, and particularly uh, after the Cold War came to an end in the early 1990s, Europeans seem to have agreed upon the universal principle that human rights got to be respected unconditionally. Why do you think the Europeans have attached such great importance to the principle of human rights? Well, first of all, in terms of perhaps very large um, timeline context, it is because the notion, or many notions, that actually feed the concept and the posture of uh, human rights were born on European soil. Uh, um, it is indeed uh, through a lot of American energy and American uh, steam uh, that those instruments had been introduced and those texts and those instruments had been uh, introduced at the beginning after World War I but that mainly after 45, after the end of World War II had been introduced up to the international sphere. Um, I think that what happened um, in the late 80s, the beginning of the 90s, you refer to uh, once the um, Soviet bloc uh, uh, collapsed and the Berlin Wall was over, was that Europeans in a way had bad conscience regarding the way they had been treating the eastern central part of the continent for over a generation and actually sacrificing, I'm, I'm globalizing of course, uh, sacrificing uh, uh, human rights interests as well as humanitarian principles uh, uh, for the sake of political interests and actually the, the, the two block game and in a way that was also the, emphasizing those values once again was a way of trying to catch over, catch up with what had been happening or rather had not been sufficiently happening between the late 40s and the late 80s. Standing by in Iran is uh, Gamba Nadare a renowned Iranian scholar. Let me quickly have your thoughts on the definition of human rights. In Iran, which is accused of combining church with the state, and Dr. Henry Kissinger said that uh, when we look at the progress of human civilization, the separation of a state from church is one major step in the correct direction. However, Iran, a Persian state that boasts of a different and glorious history, is walking the other way around. So let me have your interpretations about human rights. That rests on the assumption that perhaps uh, there is the issue of cultural diversity in examining the implications of human rights, right? Well, that's a good question that many people are also asking, at least for the past 40 years. I think this kind of uh, 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 governance uh, that was chosen in Iran came through a referendum, national referendum, back, uh, uh, back in 19, uh, 1979. People chose this kind of establishment and governance, and, and that's precisely what has been going on until now. That's part of the answer. But the other one has to be this. We are not living in a perfect universe. Our human rights records, our human rights practices, be it in China, Iran, or even the United States and Europe, are not perfect either. What we need to understand is to understand and respect our each, our each other's values and beliefs. At the same time, we need to sit down and act like adults and, and sort out our differences with regard to the uh, principles of human rights through dialogue and communication and understanding, not through, you know, uh, unilateral reports that we, we issue each and every year just, just for domestic consumption, hoping that others won't see that we have really to the terrible short, uh, shortfalls and shortages with regard to our own record uh, regarding human rights. So, so yes, we are not living in a perfect universe. Iran's human, rec human rights records are not perfect either, just like what is happening in Europe with regard to the way they are treating uh, m migrants uh, and minorities, just as the way the United States government refuses to give more jobs to the people of color, to migrants, or, or try to, to separate children from their, from their families who are trying to have a decent life in the United States. So yes, Iran has a lot 
to learn from others. At the same time, others also have a lot to learn from Iran. Let's sit down together just right now, like, like what we are doing right now, and, and help each other to improve global human rights issue, not just those that are confined to our borders, because we are now living in a connected world. We need connected, connected solutions, not national solutions or reports. And that's precisely the problem, problem now that we are discussing right now. Yes, indeed, regarding the definition of human rights, we do face the differences between the national sovereignty as well as important of human rights. Uh, when President Trump puts America first, uh, separating child from the family, that's uh, similarly an issue uh, regarding human rights as well as uh, uh, the sovereignty of a nation state. Having said this, let me go back to uh, Professor Huo Zhengxin. Regardless of China's efforts on fighting against ter terrorism and separatism, uh, Secretary Pompeo accuses China of imprisoning religious minorities in internment camps in Xinjiang, which he called the stain of the century. Now, how would you respond to the criticism from uh, the Trump administration? Why does the U.S. fail to understand the perspectives that China has made on trying to maintain the peace and the stability in the Xinjiang Uyghur Autonomous Region? Well, uh, in China, there is a famous saying, practice is the sole test for uh, judging truth. Well, uh, 10 years ago, I, I believe that you can find there is many uh, evidences to show that terrorism was rampant in Xinjiang. Uh, killing, arson, and violence was popular, which claimed the lives of many people there, regardless of their race, gender, or age. And now the situation in Xinjiang is much, much better. No terrorist attacks happened in the past three years. And society has resumed stability and prosperity. So I think that the, uh, it is undoubted that the uh, Chinese policy in Xinjiang aims to fight terrorism and to maintain social stability and to protect safety, life of people, which I believe is the, you know, it's trying to protect the heart of human rights. Indeed, I may remind you that the documentary released by the CTTN on Xinjiang several miles ago has told the true situation in Xinjiang to the international community. Unfortunately, the United States seems to choose to turn a black eye. So this reflects, in my, in my opinion, the double standard of the American on the human rights issues. I just, wait, 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 just want to make another example. I noticed that. Uh, the New York Times uh, has, uh, has a comment uh, on two instances on the same day. Uh, when it, it comments on the Chinese government lockdown city of Wuhan, the New York Times says that it is a great cost to the personal uh, liberty. However, when the Italian government locked down the city of Milan, Venice, the New York Times praised the government to sacrifice its own economy to save Europe from coronavirus. So I think that double standard is very, very obvious in American report. Thank you very much. That's the first half of discussion about uh, uh, the release of human rights reports, the annual country reports by the State Department of the U.S. government, as well as uh, uh, a similar one issued by the Chinese authorities to accuse the U.S. of violating their human rights. And no country is perfect. That's a, a consensus agreed upon by participants in this discussion on dialogue. Thank you, everybody, for being part of this meaningful dialogue. Now, in the second part of our discussion, when we come back, we'll take a look at the latest in the ongoing spread of no novel coronavirus due to the severity. The WHO has now declared the outbreak a pandemic, which took less than three months to spread worldwide. Welcome back. In the second half, we are happy to be joined by Isabel and uh, Jove. First of all, uh, cases of infections have been found in over 100 countries. Isabel, uh, is it too late for WHO to declare pandemic at this moment? Well, quite a lot of people think it is a little late and would have welcomed a more uh, proactive uh, a declaration from the WHO. I, it's a matter of judgment. You know, what is a pandemic? It doesn't, it doesn't, you know, make that much material difference except that it does allow for certain funds to be released once a pandemic is declared. And it also focuses attention, I think. I mean, a pandemic 
technically is the spread of, of, a, of a pathogen to which populations have no immunity in rapid ways uh, internationally. Well, that's pretty much you know, what we've had for a while now. So I, it is a little puzzling as to why they didn't respond earlier. Jove, what do you think of uh, the response by the WHO? Yeah, I agree, and this is, I believe, the global appreciation, at least in the West, is that actually the uh, World Health Organization uh, was in a way timid. Uh, 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 and actually, uh, those definitions and those declarations could have been made earlier. Now, would have made uh, uh, a tremendous difference in the way most governments had reacted? I'm not so sure. But I felt that th those debates right now are, in a way, um, uh, out of touch, out of contact with the gravity of the situation over so many um, uh, countries right now. So uh, yes, indeed, when we'll be doing the perspective uh, uh, um, uh, study of what happened uh, during these last three months or so, I think we will find out that actually WHO could have been uh, a more rapid. Gamba, we are seriously worried about the escalation of the uh, severity of uh, COVID-19 in Iran as well as in Italy, a member state of the European Union. Tell us the latest in your country. I mean, uh, could the Iranian authorities possibly copy what China has done in effectively, for example, uh, uh, let me go back to Isabel. Now, Italy turns out to be the worst case scenario uh, other than China, which is getting very quickly to the end game somehow. Now, what do you make of the prospects of Italy? Is it easy for the Italian government to copy our lessons and to draw inspirations from what China's done to effectively prevent the spread of the virus? I think in general terms, we all probably need to learn from each other. I mean, one of the reasons that Italy was struck so hard and so quickly was that of all European countries, it is the one with the largest Chinese workforce, the, it, particularly in northern Italy, where, where there are many, many Chinese workers in textile industries which have been set up in order to enjoy the Made in Italy label. These people largely come from Wenzhou, and Wenzhou, as you know, is the city in China which, which was also severely hit, the one outside uh, Hunan, but with big connections, uh, again, to Wuhan. So you can follow that chain of transmission pretty directly, and the speed and scale of the epidemic in Italy very much reflects movements of people uh, for particular reasons. Now, Italy, again, because it was aware of this, uh, and because the, the, uh, the epidemic spread very quickly, uh, did take much more radical action than we've seen in earlier, than we've seen in other uh, countries. I think it's quite difficult for uh, Western democracies to say we are adopting methods which uh, look a little authoritarian to many electorates. But if you look, for example, at the case of South Korea or, or Taiwan or Thailand or other countries which had early uh, outbreaks and which did indeed move quite quickly to lock down or to limit movements or to advocate isolation, to test effectively and rapidly, I think that's probably an easier model to advocate um, politically probably in terms of, of the medical impact, you know, they're, they're pretty similar. Gamba, uh, we have noticed the severity of uh, COVID-19 in your country. Heavy casualties have been inflicted upon uh, many senior government officials and uh, members of the parliament. Let us know more about the severity in your country, please. Well, Yang, uh, three days ago, I lost my cousin to uh, the coronavirus uh, disease uh, because we didn't have enough kits, uh, test kits in the capital, Tehran, so that the uh, doctors could, could, could have, you know, uh, earlier identified his, his, his weakness and his infection. The same goes to many other people around the country. More than 500 people have lost their lives. Many people are quarantined. We don't have enough test kits. Yes, we got some from, from China, but it's not enough, just as the way there aren't, you know, there, there is a huge shortage of uh, test kits in Europe and the United States. Iran is suffering uh, from the same kind of shortages. Uh, the, the Yang, this is a weapon of mass destruction. 
it has touched the lives of each and every one of us on this planet of ours. This came because we are living in a connected world, in a globalized community. As I told you, we need a global response. Why do you think that Iran is suffering right now? Because we did not have uh, store rooms and depots and, and storage rooms that you know have uh, millions of supplies of medical medical equipment like masks, sanitizers, or, or gloves and stuff like that, or test kits. The same problem exists in the United States and of course in Europe. I think we need to come to our senses and stop you know, issuing human rights reports against each other and realized how fragile we are all together. If China is affected, it is going to affect Iran. And if Iran is affected and sanctioned by the United States, it is going to affect its, its uh, neighbors and, of course, Europe and the United States, just as the way it is right now happening. Iran is now the new China. Iran is spreading the same virus to, to other countries. Why? We don't have enough kids. We are under sanctions. People are dying here because we don't have enough medical supplies. I think we need a global response and for that to happen we need to have a global health system because even if Iran succeeds in, in containing the virus, what about other countries in the region like Afghanistan, Syria, Yemen? These countries are war-torn. They need all these kinds of helps from the international community. So the solution is not you know, for China to take care of itself or for Iran to take care of itself or for Europe and America to take care of themselves. No. We need a global response a global health system with core values and supplies that immediately would be available for each and every member of the United Nations uh, at this critical point in time. If we have this kind of, you know, uh, the system in place, we wouldn't see the spread of the global virus across the there globe. There is a sharp decline in the number of uh, uh, cases of infections in China as we get close to the second stage of uh, uh, containing the virus and the spread as such. Uh, However, China, China cannot sit back complacently as we are not alone. Uh, we are in the same boat with other countries uh, of the world. And one of the major issues uh, that has uh, generated headlines around the world is uh, whether China is able to promote the transparency through cooperation and coordination with the WHO. Um, I wonder if uh, authorities in Iran, I, I would like to have a short reply, please, Gamber, we don't have enough air time. Do you think uh, authorities in Iran have been uh, cooperating uh, with WHO to exchange reports about the uh, nature, uh, severity and the skill of the spread uh, uh, following the outbreak. Uh, let us know very quickly. Well, well, Yang, the, nobody tried to cover up the, the sheer, you know, number of those who have been affected. The simple explanation is that we didn't have test kits earlier. That's one of the reasons. At the same time, Iran is cooperating with the World Health Organization and, of course, China. Iran is also getting help from, from uh, the United Kingdom, France, and, of course, Germany. But Iran doesn't accept any kind of help from the United States because, this is the, the, because U.S. sanctions are the reason we are suffering. The U.S. needs to lift the sanctions so that in the, our intelligence national partners could help us get rid of this, you know, the weapon of mass destruction that is threatening not just the, li just the lives of ordinary Iranians, but many people in the region and beyond. We Thank need so much. the sanctions to be lifted so that we could fight this, you know, disease. Uh, Jov, Toka, uh, what about Italy, uh, which sees uh, the most embarrassing severity and adversity of the situation? One of the reasons is that the Italian government runs short of uh, medical supplies and equipment. Uh, China is uh, very quickly coming to their rescue. Um, you know, our medical team has been sent there to hopefully help alleviate the concerns of our Italian friends who, when uh, China was uh, struggling in the moments of uh, uh, the difficult times, uh, the Italian government came to our help. So what do you think of uh, the coordination of the international society in providing the Italian government with what they need? In fact, they have uh, appealed to the European Union uh, for uh, activating a mechanism that may hopefully uh, provide Rome with uh, necessary facilities and uh, medical supplies. But what do you think of the silent response from Brussels? You know, uh, this, is, this is a very embarrassing point, I think, for all Europeans and for the EU as an organization, as a presence, as a political or social presence on, on world map. You know, it's, it's very noble and you cannot disagree with calls for global solutions and common cooperation and, and, and let borders put apart when we try, we as human race, as humanity, to overcome this crisis. 
But then you see very quickly, without really looking far away, that uh, these are not the elements which prevail. Uh, you just saw in what um, uh, the intervention from Tehran just um, uh, outlined elements which are political or at least use political postures to um, explain why not cooperating, for example, with the United States, because the United States is the reason for the difficulties that Iran has. So uh, a political argumentation are so often into, put into the state. When coming back to Italy and to the calls the Italians they did put, uh, uh, to their European uh, colleagues and which were not satisfied. Actually, Germany and France actually clarified that they cannot supply the Italians uh, with more masks and with more uh, 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 breath aspirators. And actually, China did that or sold that and, or, or gave the Italians, right? And the Italians already said that they will be remembering this gesture of China in moments of difficulty and crisis. Uh, uh, so once again, this is a, a, a not very glorified moment in the, uh, uh, in the history and in the presence of EU cooperation. And I'm sure that people will be um, uh, um, um, print of that. And perhaps um, once the crisis is over, which is still so far away from us right now, perhaps try to get some, some insights out of that. Isabel, everybody is looking into the future trying to figure out uh, when this um, uh, pandemic will come to an end. Um, what do you think will be the, um, the time when we can get relaxed? Um, you know, the, the summer might, might be the time, but well, it remains uh, unknown. <laughs> A lot of uncertainties are lying ahead. The consequences remain unknown. It uh, yes, go ahead. I, I, I think you're right. There, there is, and you know, n none of us knows. Uh, the the, the uh, theories that are put forward, which are, I think, equally credible, one is that these, uh, this type of virus tends to die down in the summer months, perhaps. We don't know if this will. Uh, it's not likely to disappear. Uh, so I think that the British scientific view at the moment is that it, the best outcome is that it becomes, as it were, a seasonal uh, virus to which uh, uh, populations have acquired immunity. So that after the first wave, which is devastating, immunity then builds up in the population and its recurrence is therefore much less threatening. We are in the moment of, of maximum crisis. But, you know, having said that, this is all rather unknown. And I think that some of the lessons that we have learned from this is that global public health and national public health is as strong as its weakest link. So, you know, one of the advantages that European countries have Thank is you so that much, they Isabel. have universal health services. Thank you so much. Unlike Medical the United experts States, and which immunologists does not. around so the world the other thing that I think got to work together to figure out whether um, we can find a global solution. We are in the same boat. Thank you for being with us. I'll see you next time. Goodbye.